Welcome to Epworth. We're glad that you're here to join us in our Pancake Supper slash Ash Wednesday service. We did both of them in once, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, so our service today is all going to be up on the screen, so you can follow along up there um, because of the snow and our continual need for the new printer that I'm told will be here on Friday, which is very exciting. Uh, we don't have bulletins, so everything will be up on the screen. So let's stand together and we'll join in the call to worship. God sent Christ into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. Let us pray. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathe into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Call forth our prayers and acts of tenderness and strengthen us to face our mortality that we may reach with confidence for your mercy. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to stay standing as we sing together Spirit of the Living God. If you want to read it in your hymnal, it's number 393, and we're going to sing it through twice together. seated. I'm going to read tonight um, a poem adaptation of Genesis chapter 2 verses 4 through 17. So I invite you to hear the creation story in a new way. In the beginning there was dirt. No trees, no brushes, no rivers or streams or lakes, just the dirty dusty ground. And every once in a while water would well up from underneath and it would get all muddy and marshy. And God looked around and thought, well, that's no fun. So God sat down in the dirt and scooped up some clay in God's own hands and rolled part of it into a ball and pinched and poked and mashed it up a bit. And God rolled part of it out into long, long, skinny logs and bent up the ends and the middles. And God put all the pieces together, carefully smoothing out the seams and blew into the creature's nostrils with the breath of life. And voila! God had a human being in God's muddy, messy hands. Then God looked around at the dust and mud and thought, I can do better than this. So God started planting trees and bushes and vines, grasses and flowers and shrubs of all kinds. Soon, God had a beautiful garden growing, full of fruits and nuts and vegetables for the human to eat. In the middle of the garden were two special trees, God's very favorite, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The human liked to look at them and wonder what they were for. Now God drew a line in the dirt 
and made a river flow through the fertile land called Eden. The river flowed through the garden to water it, and beyond the garden it divided into four branches, and those streams spread and gushed and flowed across the land in four directions. So God led the human by the hand and showed it all around the garden, pointing out the roses that needed pruning, explaining how to care for the passion fruit vines, and how to plant beans and corn and squash together. This is your job now, to cultivate and care for the land, said God. You can eat any fruit you like here, except for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I know it looks shiny and colorful and appealing, but it's not a fruit you're equipped to digest. If you eat of that fruit, life as you know it will be over. For by your knowledge and judgment, you will separate yourself from the rest of creation. And by choosing what you want, instead of honoring the limits and boundaries woven into the cycles of this garden I have given you, you will choose a path that takes you away from the close relationship you have with me now. And though I will follow you, the work of my hands, beloved creature of my own making, you will be haunted by that separation and struggle forever after to regain the sense of unity and wholeness you feel now. And even if you live a long life, the day that you eat this fruit will be the beginning of death for you. And God saw that the human had stopped listening and only understood in part anyway. And God sighed and knew it would be a long journey from Eden to death and beyond and back. And so God rolled up God's sleeves once more and went on with the messy work of creation, redemption, and transformation. Let's sing again together our prayer for illumination, Spirit of the Living God. You can remain seated. We're just going to sing it through once. Spirit of the Living God. now from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 and 12 through 17. Listen for a word from the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in its ages to come. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow in anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this evening. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a kid, we spent a lot of time in the water. We lived um, right on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, friends of ours, a lot of our friends had boats. And so since we lived really close, every summer we spent a lot of time on the water. And I remember that sometimes when someone was new on the boat with us for the first time, they would begin to feel a little bit seasick, and especially if the water was really choppy that day. And whenever that happened, our friends who owned the boat would tell them to lean out over the rail and look at the water. 
For someone who is not used to being on the water, that is not an intuitive thing. What you want to do when you begin to feel seasick is to sit down and close your eyes and put your head in your hands or even between your knees, but that ultimately won't help. What helps is looking out at the very water that's making you sick. Feeling seasick is one of those paradoxical things, right, where the more you try to hide from the things that's making you sick, the worse you feel. And healing comes only from facing the very thing that's making you feel sick in the first place. I think we, as humans, have this tendency in our lives to want to avoid things that bring us pain or discomfort. We will avoid them at all cost. We all get really good at living in a place called denial. And that's why I think Ash Wednesday service is, uh, feels to some people one of the weirdest worship services of all of our services throughout the year. And maybe that's why it's not that well attended. I mean, we actually have pretty good attendance tonight, but normally, I think it's because we had pancakes right before, right? We had the bigger draw. But it's not usually well attended, and I think that's because Ash Wednesday invites us to look at all of the pain and brokenness and death in our lives. Ash Wednesday is a day where we remember that we are broken, wounded humans in need of God's healing grace. The ashes on our foreheads remind us that life is fleeting, that one day this life will come to an end. And quite honestly, we don't want to think about that. And why would we? Society all around us tells us every day that we can defy age. If we just buy this one thing, our whole lives will change. We can look younger and beautiful forever, and we can delay death through technology, and sometimes sheer force of will is, I think, what they're telling us. But we know that ultimately none of that is true. One day, whether we like it or not, whether we are ready for it or not, we will all die. And even though we know that is true, we don't want to face that reality until we absolutely have to. We would much rather pretend that everything is fine, like ostriches with our head in the sand, until something comes along and bites us, forcing us to confront reality. And that's what Ash Wednesday does for us. Ash Wednesday, with all of its stark images and challenging scripture readings, the minor music that we sing and the smudges of ashes on our forehead, invites us to pull our heads out of the sand, to look in the mirror long enough to see the truth about who we are. On Ash Wednesday, we are invited to face the things that are making us sick in our lives, the things that are causing brokenness and woundedness in the world around us. We are invited to face the literal and spiritual places of death in our lives. Our scripture passage tonight from the book of Joel is not read very often in church. In fact, about the only time it's read is on Ash Wednesday. This passage is filled with lots of stark images of death and destruction. The prophet Joel paints a picture of utter devastation and desolation. He describes an army that is marching towards the people of God. The army is huge, it tells us, too numerous to count, bigger than any army that ever existed or will exist. And yet, the land is green and lush and plentiful before them, just like the Garden of Eden. And behind them, the land they have already passed through is nothing but flames and barrenness. The army destroys every ounce of life in their path. All the people, the livestock, even all of the vegetation, everything in its path is destroyed. And this all-consuming army is heading straight for the people of God, never wavering from its path. These words of Joel, the images that he paints, are made endurable only by the words of hope that come at the end of the passage. We can bear to look on this image of utter devastation and desolation that Joel paints for us only because of the hope that God offers the people of God at the end. God says, even now, as the army comes toward you, turn to me. Joel reminds us that God is gracious and merciful, that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It's the love and the grace, the hope and the possibility of being made new. That is what Ash Wednesday really ultimately is about. But what Ash Wednesday reminds us is that the only way to break free of the fear, to break free of the woundedness and brokenness in our lives is to face it. It's to look into the water. We must face all of that stuff about ourselves that we would rather hide and allow the grace of God to remind us that who we are does not continually dictate who we will be. Joel reminds us that even when our lives are a mess, even when our lives are at their most devastating and desolating, that is not the end. That is not the life that God wants for us. 
God wants us to have an abundant, flourishing life. Tonight, we are invited to look at all those places in our lives that we would rather hide. God asks us to face it head on, but not simply so that we can look at it and feel guilty and bad about it, not so that we can wallow in self-loathing, but rather God invites us to look at all of those hidden parts of ourselves because looking is the first step towards healing. God invites us to take an honest look at our lives, to see the places of brokenness, woundedness, and death, so that we, in facing them, can allow the grace of God to transform them into places of healing and wholeness and life. This past week, I came across a video on Facebook of a high school dance troupe that performed to a spoken word piece by a man named John Jorgensen. It's called, What Room Does Fear Have? And from the very first line spoken, I was captivated. It starts out with these words. I used to be afraid of tomorrow, afraid that who I was would continually dictate who I am and that who I would be might be someone who I didn't like very much at all, as if there was no such thing as being made new. As I watched the girls in the video put into movement those powerful words about fear and being made new, I thought to myself, that's what Ash Wednesday is about. That is precisely what God invited us to experience this night. So I'm going to play the video for you. And as you watch it, I hope you will experience it as an invitation to experience tonight and the whole season of Lent, not as a time of brokenness and pain and death, but as a time of wholeness and being made new. Tonight, as we face our own brokenness, we also turn our faces towards the cross. We get ready to journey with Jesus in these 40 days of Lent because we know that the brokenness in our lives and world will never have the last word. Easter is coming. Tonight, we face our sin and fear with courage because who you are today does not have to continually dictate who you will be. I invite you to watch the video. And um, Beth, can you turn the sound up? as far as it will go without making awful noises, because the word part is really important. Thank you. Let's hear it for your Muhammad Seymour dance team. I used to be afraid of tomorrow, afraid that who I was would continually dictate who I am and that who I would be might be someone who I didn't like very much at all as if there was no such thing as being made new. I used to be afraid of opinions, afraid that though words could not break my bones, they certainly would shatter my dreams, as though I started doing this for the approval of many rather than the glory of one. I used to be afraid of failure, afraid of losing, afraid of falling, afraid of being wrong, creating busts and looking absolutely stupid because who am I to even try and make a difference? As if those setbacks were anything more than the laying down of stepping stones on the road to success. I used to be afraid. Yeah. Then I did a little research. And by that I mean that I researched and researched and researched over and over What room does fear have? What room does fear have when I lean on hope? What room does fear have when I search for something more? When I realize what's good and I stand in awe? When I run with perseverance? When I walk by faith and when I rest? In comfort, what room does fear have when I sing with praise, when I take hold of inspiration, explore possibility, and step into freedom? What room does fear have when I discover strength, embrace courage, remember peace, declare truth, choose joy, experience life, and conquer death? What room does fear have when I find perfection in the one place I never thought to be, in weakness? When I let the past be the past and the future has no limit, when they can talk all they want, but their opinion doesn't matter, or when failure is nothing more and nothing less than the road by which I walk my path to success, I'll ask you one last time. What room does fear have when I make room for love? What are you 
afraid of. If you couldn't hear the words, we'll put it up on our Facebook page so you can um, listen to it again. It's very powerful. Friends in Christ, every year at this time in the Christian calendar, we celebrate our redemption through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lent is a time to prepare for this celebration and to renew our life in the Paschal mystery. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We begin our journey to Easter with the sign of ashes placed on our forehead. This ancient sign speaks of the frailty and uncertainty of human life and marks the penitence of this community. And yet if ashes only remind us of our lowliness, we miss a sacred revelation of this season. We were not created from discarded muck, something God scraped from God's feet with disgust after wandering the garden of paradise. We were created of sacred ground, of the same bits and pieces, the same elements that God used to create the stars, the planets, and the vast, beautiful, wonderful, and fearful universe that still cannot contain the incredible mystery of our loving God. We are made from dust, and to dust we return. We are made from love, and to love we return. We are made from mystery, and to mystery we return. We are made by God, and to God we will return. We are golden, precious, beloved to our Creator, and God longs for us to return to that garden of paradise once again. I invite you, therefore, in the name of Christ, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and penitence, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by reading and meditating on the Word of God. So in these moments, as we offer these 40 days to God, let us bow our heads to our Creator and Redeemer and silently confess our sins. Let us pray. God, we come to you this night confessing that we are not all that you have called us to be. There are times when we are not loving, we are not kind, we are not honest, we are not generous in our thoughts and our actions. There are times when we don't do the things you ask us to do, and there are times that we do the very thing you asked us not to do. So God, we give these next 40 days to you asking that you would use them to create in us a new being. God, we offer not only these days, but our lives to you. We invite you to transform us, to make us into something new, and to send us out into the world to share your redeeming love with those around us. As we dedicate these 40 days to you, God, we, I invite you to tell God now what it is you will be doing to observe a holy season of Lent. Tell God what it is you will give up or what it is you will take on in order to dedicate these 40 days to him. Holy God, we ask that you would bless these efforts. Remind us in the moments that we fail that we are not composed only of our failures, but we are composed in your love. Strengthen us for this journey. Help us to face the journey to Jerusalem unafraid as we remember that Christ walks by our side. We praise these things in his holy and merciful name. And all of God's people said, amen. We're going to sing together, Have, Our Own Way, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. It's number 382 in your Methodist hymnal. Let's stand and sing it together. Open your hymnal, 382.
I'm just kidding. So um, I'm going to pray over the ashes. And then um, for those of you who have never done this before, I just want to let you know what's going to happen. I'm going to invite you to come up at your will. There are no ushers to tell you when to come, so you just get to decide. You can come to the front, and I will um, put ashes on your forehead in the sign of a cross and uh, say something to you. And then after you have the ashes, you're invited to either kneel at the altar as you would like to or to return to your seat. After everybody who wants to has had um, imposition of ashes on their forehead, we'll join in the communion liturgy and share in communion together. So let's pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth and stars. May these ashes be for us a sign of our mortality and penitence, as well as a sign of the sacred love with which you have made us. May they remind us that only by your gracious gifts of mercy and redemption are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We're going to remain in a spirit and attitude of prayer as we come up for ashes, so I invite you to come as you are able.
we sing the first verse of Have Thine Own Way one more time? Mike, will you put up the hymn number? Is it five? 382. We're just going to sing the first verse. on the screen with me as we begin our communion liturgy. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on the earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm that on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, the bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. 
In the Methodist Church, we celebrate an open communion table, which means anybody who wants a deeper relationship with God, no matter um, where your membership stands, you're welcome to dine with us because we don't believe the table belongs to us but belongs to God. We will serve tonight by intinction, which means you will tear off a piece of the bread. I will tear off a piece of the bread, give it to you, and you will dip it into the cup. Um, can one of our all-knowing um, altar guild people get out the gluten-free thing for me because I completely forgot to do it? Thank you. I appreciate it. As soon as Carrie gets back, we'll have gluten-free wafers up here if you need them. I invite you to just come up as you're able, and there will be no ushers to send you up for this either, so just come up as you're able to receive the gifts that God has prepared for us. Bill. Hold on. I've got it somewhere. Why don't we sing our closing hymn while we're taking communion? So we're going to sing, Lord, I want to be a Christian, except for we're going to do all the verses. It's number 402 in your hymnal. Come as you're able.
stand and pray with me. Holy God, we give you thanks for this night. We thank you for these moments where we could bear our souls before you, be reminded that we are forgiven and loved by you. A night where we could dedicate these next 40 days as we journey with you towards the cross. A night where we could share in the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup with you and with one another. We give you thanks for all of these things and more. And we pray that as we leave this place, you would help us to go in a spirit of repentance, that we might turn our hearts towards you once more. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite you to go in peace and as you can to go in silence. In the name of the God who created, redeems, and sustains us all. Amen. Amen.